Welcome back or welcome if you're just joining us. It's the France Fenquet debate. We're looking at the legacy of the greatest, Muhammad Ali. Uh, the first of two days of memorial services taking place in his hometown of Louisville, Kentucky. They started uh, with an Islamic prayer service. There'll be a big uh, funeral on Friday. Uh, it'll include the likes of former President Bill Clinton. Uh, the current president of Turkey is one of those uh, slated to take part. Uh, we're talking about it uh, with uh, sports reporter and former boxing judge Nita Wiggins. Welcome back. Welcome back as well to uh, Michael Kirtley, a journalist, filmmaker, and uh, a man who knew Muhammad Ali well, both being 30 miles, uh, grew up, growing up 30 we grew miles. grew 30 miles apart, and of course, I lived under the shadow of Muhammad Ali when I was a kid. I mean, he was like an, an idol to anybody that was a kid in Kentucky at that time. Muhammad Ali or Cassius Clay was was the, the name that you that you talked about, and, and I think that. But let me, let me okay. just let me just say hello to every, everybody I'm else. Sorry. here. Uh, Gerald Horn, uh, who uh, teaches at the University uh, of Houston, chair of uh, the History and African American Studies uh, Department. He's with us from Philadelphia. Welcome back, and welcome back to Roger Muntu, host of Voice of America's The RM Show, who is in uh, Washington D.C. Uh, Roger telling us before the break how he was a five-year-old boy when that fight took place in Kinshasa, the rumble in the jungle, uh, the al Ali regaining his title against the undefeated George Foreman in an eighth-round knockout in the capital of what was then Zaire. The fight was delayed by six weeks, a delay that gave Ali more time to rally fans to his cause. I said, last night, I had a dream. When I got to Africa, I had one hell of a rumble. I had to beat Tarzans behind first for claiming to be the king in the jungle. For this fight, I've wrestled with alligators. I've tussled with a whale. I done handcuffed lightning and put thunder in jail. You know I'm bad. I can drown a drink of water and kill a dead tree. Wait till you see Muhammad Ali. Uh, Roger Muntu, when he arrived, uh, w we saw the, the famous documentary, When We Were Kings. When he arrived uh, in Kinshasa, w was he, did he immediately win over uh, the population? Well, that's a very good question. When he arrived in Kinshasa, uh, then what, what, what uh, Cong uh, Zairean back then, Congolese today, were, were thinking was, uh, as you, we all know, uh, he, would, he was lighter skinned than uh, George Foreman. So Congolese were more thinking that, oh, he's more uh, a white person than George Foreman. So they, they were more thinking that George Foreman would be the most that the people would like. But when he arrived, he, he quickly connected with the Congolese, you know, he was social. He was embracing everybody on the street. And it was different when George Foreman arrived. And that's why the population quickly, uh, uh, you know, became so, I mean, liked uh, uh, Muhammad Ali. And he, he could talk to them. He could play with them. You saw him running on the street with, uh, you know, while he was getting ready for his fight. He was getting ready with kids running after him. And it was totally different. It was, the contact was different uh, than uh, George Foreman and, and uh, Zaire back and then. And what was your memory of the fight itself? My memory of the fight itself was, uh, um, uh, <laughs> it, it, first of all, it, this is at 4 a.m. In, in Kinshasa. This is really late. And, and I was a kid, and, and my dad, who back then was also working for the government, wanted all of us to stay up and watch this fight that Mobutu parted with $10 million because he wanted to see his name and the name of the, 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 the Zairean be on the map, which really worked. Um, so so the, the, the memory of the fight itself is, is to see the crowd, man, the people, like the country. It's, it's as if the country just, um, uh, uh, th there's a block in the whole, everybody's just talking about this everywhere and and everybody's watching even in the villages they had small tvs where where there was no electricity but they'll put battery just so they can watch the, the, this fight uh, was it something that ultimately uh today uh, are you happy the fight took place as you say there was criticism of uh the strong man of the time uh, marshall mobutu uh for uh, spending money on this Mm -hmm. we, we, well, b back then, um, uh, today, I, I, well, I'm, I'm very happy. So are other uh, uh, Congolese and who are some of them that I also talk to every day now, that especially debating this uh, Muhammad Ali, uh, you know, uh, death in, uh, in my show, in the RM show at VOA. Um, everybody's pretty much happy because then today in the U.S., and I've lived in the U.S. for the past 28 years, um, everywhere I go, when they ask me where I'm originally from, uh, when I say the DRC, ex-Zaire, 
it, the only thing somebody will, can think of is Rumble of the Jungle, is, is Muhammad Ali. It, that's the, the first thing they'll say. So, so what Mobutu wanted to do was to put Zaire on the map, and, and I guess that, uh, that, that was successful. That, uh, that made uh, really uh, Zairean and Congolese be known worldwide. Nita Wiggins? Uh, let me tell you a story about being a little girl in the South at that time. I followed boxing because my dad followed boxing, and I wanted to go watch the fight on closed circuit because I was an Ali fan. I was eight years old. But guess what? My mom said, girls don't follow boxing. Girls don't go downtown mm. to the Civic Center to watch the match. So I didn't get to watch the match on closed circuit. My brother did. My brother and my dad went. But that's how far Ali reached. He reached into Augusta, Georgia and touched me all those years ago. All right, the fight was more than four decades ago. The needling would continue between Ali, the convert to Islam, and George Foreman, who became an ordained minister. The one thing about Muhammad, we would meet all the time and discuss Bible scriptures and religion. We'd argue so much and argue that we get thirsty and hope to meet again so that we could do some more arguing and get thirsty. But we always ended with a big embrace. He loved me. Gerald Horn, let me ask you about this. Uh, Ali, uh, who is Muslim, a convert to, to, to Muslim, and we're seeing with this funeral service, we're having an Islamic service this Thursday, and then on the Friday, an ecumenical service. Uh, what does that say to you? Well, I think it's striking that you note that President Erdogan of Turkey is attending this service. The Turks, and particularly President Erdogan, has been taking a very close and particular interest in black Americans. When he was in Washington just a few weeks ago, he took time to meet with black American Muslims. And indeed, his chief political opponent, Fatullah Gulen, lives outside of Philadelphia. And in fact, the Gulen movement has been starting charter schools in black communities, particularly in Texas and New Jersey. And so we also need to look at Muhammad Ali not only as a symbol for anti-war opponents and a symbol for black Americans, but a symbol for Muslims worldwide. A symbol for Muslims uh, worldwide. And uh, Michael Kirtley, uh, he helped a lot of things go mainstream. In, in this sense, pe people were in, in the 60s, when the initial reaction, when he was joining the, the black Muslims of Ma Malcolm X, well, well, you could say he also invented rap. You could say there's so many, inf so many ways that, that, that Muhammad Ali influenced culture at that time, uh, from making it mainstream, as you said, to, to, be, to protest the Vietnam War, to actually being a draft uh, resistor, uh, to uh, j he was the first m major Muslim, major sports figure to join Islam. He was also a very young person. Therefore, he was very inspirational to the university students of that particular period. I mean, I remember I, at, at university. Because during those three years where he suspended, he goes around to universities and gives lectures. He, he absolutely did. And, and so I think that we, we tend to, it would be really a very big mistake to put, to, to put Ali in the box of being a sports figure who somehow had influence because he didn't see himself that way. Let's, let's, I talked to him many times about that particular issue. He didn't particularly like talk, talking about his boxing career when I was talking to him. He accepted to and all of that, but he liked to talk about, for, let me give you a story. It's very, very interesting to illustrate this because going back to the idea of being bitter, Ali was the least bitter person I've ever met. He was the kindest and the most humble person I've ever met. One day, I'm, I'm in my hometown of Bardstown, Kentucky, which is about a 45 minutes from, uh, from Louisville, and Ali just calls me out of the blue. It was 1 o'clock in the afternoon. It was a Saturday. And he says, Michael, I've decided to drive down to your home. I want you to fix dinner for me. But I also want you to, to ask all the children of Bardstown, Kentucky, to come and meet me in your front yard, all the children. So I go out and I, and I, and I catch three, three kids on their bikes. I say, go tell all the children of Bardstown that Ali is going to be. Within a couple of hours, there were more than 300 children, not only in my yard, but spilling out in the street, down the sidewalks and all that. That shows how much of a resonance he had among really young people. So... Ali drives out in this Winnebago that he had. He had this ivory-colored Winnebago that he took everywhere. That was, his, that was his thing. He would take kids. He would do everybody on, the, on this Winnebago. He drives out. I see him driving up. He drives up to the curb. The kids pull back, almost like they're thinking of some divine apparition. And Ali steps out of the car, and what does he do? He does magic tricks. 
he, he, start, he, takes out, he takes out a handkerchief and makes it disappear. He makes it reappear, turns it into another color. And he stood there in my front yard. And he, keep in mind, this was after he was already uh, you know, showing signs of Parkinson's. For an hour and a half with the kids, mock boxing with them, uh, signing autographs. What prompted it? Ali was that way. He was, Ali was one of the most spontaneous people that I've ever met. He was a person that loved fun. And so to get him talking about boxing, yes, for example, one time I asked him, do you still think that you were the greatest of all time? I asked him that question. He said, you don't know, I don't know if I could beat Mike Tyson. He was a murderer in the ring. You know, he, had, he was reflective. He lived in the moment. That's what, and I think that's, what's, I think that's very important to understanding the impact of Ali was not only because he was uh, because of the before he got Parkinson's, it was also very much after he got Parkinson's. He he be, he became a figure that was accepted by mainstream America. Now, it, uh, as Roger was saying, of course, he was accepted in Africa. As I mean, I've gone to Africa many times, as you know, and there is no place that I've ever been in Africa that you cannot that you can find somebody that doesn't know of, of Muhammad Ali in the desert, in the jungles, anywhere, not just in Zaire. But what I think happened after he had Parkinson's, people started having a, a certain empathy for him. And part of that empathy came from the fact that he never felt sorry for himself. That's an important point. Nita Wiggins, he, he, he didn't hide his Parkinson's disease. On the contrary, he, uh, no. he put it on display. He did. He announced in 1984 that he was suffering from Parkinson's. But, but let me go back to uh, the idea of signing autographs. One of Ali's daughters, Hannah, was interviewed just days after his death, and she explained why he signed so many autographs. He never charged. He never and, charged. Okay, he didn't charge, but his daughter said that he asked Sugar Ray Robinson, his idol, for an autograph, and Sugar Ray Robinson said no. And Ali was extremely disappointed, according to his daughter. And that is why, going forward, when someone wanted an autograph from Muhammad Ali, he signed autographs to the point of uh, having pain in his hands, if you believe th what the daughter said about that. And let me talk about Mike Tyson and the influence. I was just watching some old interviews recently, and Mike Tyson said that Muhammad Ali visited the detention center where he was as a youngster. And he, and Mike Tyson said meeting Muhammad Ali convinced him that boxing is what he wanted to do. It, it just goes back to that hands-on appeal that Muhammad Ali had. G Gerald Horn, it sounds like we're talking about a man who was always campaigning. and Campaigning for what in the end? Well, I think he was campaigning on behalf of his political beliefs. He was campaigning on behalf of his religious and spiritual beliefs. He was campaigning on behalf of black people, not only in the United States, but worldwide. But once again, I think part of the key to understanding Muhammad Ali is to understand the man who he patterned himself after. I'm speaking of Jack Johnson, who after he was condemned and targeted by the U.S. authorities, also became a performer. He played the uh, bass fiddle, for example. He acted. Muhammad Ali, you may recall, acted as well. He was in the TV movie Freedom Road, where he played a slave who rises to the U.S. Senate based on the novel by Howard Fast. He acted off-Broadway in the play Buck White, sometimes known as Big Time Buck White. And therefore, he was truly a man of the people and truly a versatile man at that. Is it a, a moment in time that can't be repeated in terms of one sports figure uh, being so influential? Gerald Horn? Oh, sorry. Say that again. I'm sorry. Here we have a sports figure who is so influential. We've been talking about it. Uh, the, the, the fight for civil rights, the fight against the Vietnam War, uh, the uh, fight against, uh, for awareness of Parkinson's disease and, and many other good causes. Is there a sports figure today who could have that kind of aura or is that no longer possible? It's possible, but highly doubtful that this will recur. Part of the issue are the 
immense fortunes that are available to athletes of Ali's snatcher, which tends to dull their political sensibilities, tends to dull their cultural sensibilities. I guess an equivalent might be the boxer Floyd Merriweather, who nicknames himself Money, which dictates what he's actually after. That is to say, the dollar bill, rather than any kind of mass popularity, which was what Ali was after. Roger Muntu, let me ask you about this, because we've seen, for instance, uh, footballers who carry high the flag when they were players, like George Weah of Liberia, Didier Drogba uh, of, of Ivory Coast. Are, are sports heroes, are there sports figures today who, who you can point to that say, gosh, these guys are genuine heroes? Um, well, you mean compared to Muhammad Ali, right? Yes. Uh, I, I personally, to be honest, Van, I, I don't see... Uh, compared to Muhammad Ali, and 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 this is part also because of the time that Muhammad Ali lived in, and 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 and, and the whole uh, situation he was in. I, I don't see today someone that I can compare to Muhammad Ali personally. Nita Wiggins, uh, it's also it was people calling it the last golden age of boxing. Is that also part right. of it? The fact that boxing always had these larger than life characters yes. boxing's not that big a sport anymore no because uh, when we talk about the alphabet soup uh, all the sanctioning bodies the the championship is di is diluted at this at this point but but let me go back to that question about could we have a sports hero today who becomes so much more we all know michael jordan said republicans buy sneakers too so Michael Jordan did not take a position on a Senate race in North Carolina when Harry Gant was running an African-American. But secondly, maybe people don't know about Steve Nash. He was uh, an NBA player, played for the Dallas Mavericks at the time that I was there. Steve Nash spoke against dropping bombs in the Iraq war, and there was backlash. Of course, we were in Dallas, Texas, and there was backlash when one athlete tried to speak against dropping bombs. Well, he was banned so, from boxing. So it, it is <laughs> difficult for today's athlete to take that stand. More difficult than, uh, than in the past and more difficult, mm -hmm. uh, uh, why? Because it's, a, it's m more of a shrill well, be, be, culture? I mean, because as, as Michael was mm -hmm. said, I mean, Ali paid the ultimate sacrifice by, by having his career because Muhammad Ali was motivated to make that change. Mm. He said that if he had to die, he'd rather die in the United States fighting for civil rights, for equality, for justice, for black people. He said he was not willing to die somewhere else where people in a country were being dominated by outside forces. So that is what made him spectacularly different. Michael Kirtley, uh, we've talked about how boxing is a different sport today uh, and is his hometown, Louisville, Kentucky, where he'll be buried Friday, a different place. I would say it's totally different. And, and there is no doubt. I mean, there was, a, there was a huge controversy when they decided, when Louisville decided to name a boulevard after Muhammad Ali. Uh, today, it's considered one of the most famous landmarks in Louisville, Kentucky. But at that time, not only was it extremely controversial to do that, this must have been in the 80s, I think. Uh, it was extremely controversial to do that, but it also it, ca it caused racial hatred. There were a lot of the signs that were, that were the, of, of Muhammad Ali Boulevard were stolen by people who didn't want that, want that up there. Today, not only is Ali celebrated in Louisville, with with this with the street, there's a Muhammad Ali Center. Moreover, you would have to say that Kentucky has gone through a huge transformation in race relations during that time. I mean, from the time that Ali was a child and when I was a child, which was a little later. And and I think that Ali contributed to that greatly in Kentucky. Not necessarily in the same way elsewhere, because the fact that the fact that he was from Kentucky meant that he was interviewed when he was a a lot younger, a lot quicker on a lot of radio network stations there. He was written about in the local newspapers there. There is no, I mean, when I was, when I was in, a kid in, in grade school, our teachers used to talk about Cassius Clay. And, about, and, and the fact that there was an African-American person that, that was not specifically involved in the civil rights movement, but took on a stance 
that, ca that caused him great trouble in his own career was, I think, an inspiration for lots of kids. And I can certainly say that for my own classmates. We used to talk about it a lot. And I think that today, if race relations are better in Kentucky, it's at least partly due to our growing up with, with Cassius Clay Muhammad Ali. All right, Michael Kirtley, I want to thank you. I want to thank Nita Wiggins as well. I want to thank Roger Muntu uh, for being with us from Washington, as well as uh, Gerald Horn in Philadelphia. Uh, stay with us. Our Media Watch segment is next. Stacey, Stacey. S stay with us because it is time for Media Watch and Emma James is here. Hi, uh, Emma, uh, the, uh, the Muhammad Ali funeral, a two-day affair. Yes, absolutely. And people, well, it, it's kind of extended even longer than that because people began queuing uh, yesterday uh, looking to get hold of those free tickets to attend because it was part of Muhammad Ali's big plan for his big send-off that people should be able to attend for free um, if they were fans of his. Uh, and we see on this Twitter... Is, this is a funeral he planned long in advance. Absolutely. It was a, a decade in the making, apparently. And um, people certainly turned out in their droves, hundreds, perhaps even thousands, queuing to try to get hold of those free tickets. Uh, this family here was first in line. Um, and taking a look at, at this... Uh, the, the claim here is that one family actually started queuing on the Tuesday night, so they waited even longer. Um, I don't know whether this gentleman here, Muhammad Ali, 68 years old, who travelled all the way from oh. Bangladesh to Louisville uh, to pay tribute to his friend and namesake, I don't know if he managed to get hold of a ticket. I sincerely hope that he did. Um, I will be looking out for any news of him, I have to say. Um, however, there has been a rather sad note to these memorials in that people are trying to make money out of them. No. We've seen things like this on Craigslist uh, where people are trying to sell tickets. Not um, surprising. It's not surprising, <laughs> sadly, um, but the family have said they are very upset about it. Uh, this particular user says uh, they've got six tickets um, they're going for $100 a piece. There was one advert where they said, we'll trade for anything of value, what have you got? Um, so it's really very cynical stuff and the family have, have basically urged people not to put money in the pockets of ticket touts by paying to attend this funeral. They would rather see empty seats than know that people were profiting mm. from this particular event. Now, the spokesman for the family said, I'm disgusted and amazed that someone would try to profit from Muhammad Ali's memorial service. Um, I think perhaps some of us are less surprised. Um, but as you said earlier, this was a long time in the planning, and the Daily Beast talks about the fact that this actually could be his, almost, his final act as... Um, he wanted to be known as a kind of a Billy Graham of the Muslim world, to kind of bridge the divide between Muslims and Christians and Catholics and Jews in America. And the Daily Beast article here talks about the fact that for many millions of Americans and millions of people across the world watching these services, it'll be the first time that they'll get to see a Muslim service and will recognise that it's not that different from any other kind of funeral service for whatever religion. Um, Muhammad Ali's uh, service obviously will go on tomorrow. Tomorrow will be an interfaith affair. Today's is the Muslim affair. Um, he said in a book that was written in 2005 that he wanted to be an ambassador for Islam in America. Uh, Dean Obedallah, who actually wrote this article, says perhaps if he'd been able to provide that bridge between the cultures, then we wouldn't be in the sorry state that we are today because, of course, his dream of achieving that was stopped by the fact that he became ill with Parkinson's disease. Um, the same writer also penned this article for Mediaite, uh, pointing out the hypocrisy of Donald Trump for wanting to attend Muhammad Ali's funeral. Um, he asks, what next? Trump attending Mexican Independence Day celebrations or perhaps he'll show up at a rally for the National Organization of Women. Um, if he had his way, of course, relatives <coughs> of Muhammad Ali, who are flying in from other countries, might well not have been able to attend because he's talking about keeping Muslims out of America. Um, now, finally on this, you did ask me earlier, where, where did the friendship with Billy Crystal stem from? Because yeah, it does... The comedian Billy Crystal is going to be, uh, uh, what is it, presenting or hosting? the big event. Exactly. And, and it does seem like a rather unorthodox kind of a friendship, um, comedian versus the most famous pugilist in history. Um, and 
After the death, he posted for the greatest man I have ever known and provided a link to a 1979 appearance by Billy Crystal where he paid tribute to Muhammad Ali's career. They became friends because Billy Crystal imitated him on television and Muhammad Ali liked it. Uh, I do have a very short clip I can show you of this performance from 1979 just to show you how good Billy Crystal was at playing Muhammad Ali. I am the greatest. I am the greatest. I am Muhammad Ali. I will never be known as Cassius Clay again. Cassius Clay is a slave's name. I am now a disciple, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. I am now a black Muslim minister. I am now Muhammad Ali. So there you go. That is where the friendship stemmed from. And it really does show just how he was bridging the divides between all types of people. Uh, Nita Wicketts, because uh, <laughs> some people have been asking about this. Um, the U.S. President, mm -hmm. Barack Obama, he won't be attending because he's going to his daughter's high school graduation. Oh. Uh, well, he's a dad. Yes, he can make that decision. <laughs> 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 All right. Many thanks uh, for that, uh, Emma James. I want to thank our panel once again. Thank you for joining us here in the France Vingt Gatebe.